Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. At first glance, advertisement in South Korea is no different from what can be seen in many other countries. At the same time, the country's political, economic, and social history has shaped how goods and services are promoted and what is seen as the right way to do so. To learn more about South Korean advertising, its unique features, and its industry, we met with Professor Olga Federenko. We talked about the history of South Korean advertising, its relation to democracy, why it has been described in South Korea as the flower of capitalism, and how advertisement was, and is, an arena where social norms are renegotiated. Olga Federenko is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Seoul National University. She obtained her Bachelor in Korean Studies from the Institute of Asian and African Studies at Moscow State University and holds an MBA from Yonsei University. She completed her PhD in East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. She has published various articles and chapters on advertising in South Korea and is currently working on a book manuscript, Flower of Capitalism, South Korea Advertising at Crossroads. Professor Olga Federenko, Welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about my research to your listeners. What brought you to Korea and what sparked your interest in Korean advertisement? Well, those are actually two different questions. First, I got in Korea in 1998. At the time, I was a government scholarship student. So I received a scholarship to come to Korea and do master's degree in anything of my choice. And it happened to be business administration, but that's not why I was doing advertising research later on. So this topic came up when I was preparing application for a PhD program, and I knew I wanted to do research on something related to media in Korea. I was not sure exactly in which direction that research should go. So I was reading widely about what's happening with media in Korea, and I came across this article which described advertising censorship in Korea and you're talking 2005 2006 and at that point every single commercial which was shown on Korean TV was pre-censored by a certain independent semi-government organization so I was fascinated by the amount of effort that goes into advertising censorship and that was the beginning of this project Let's begin by looking back at history. As you wrote in your dissertation, and I quote, the late 1980s was the watershed moment for South Korea's advertising industry. Why is that? In the 1980s, many things changed in Korea and in Korean advertising. Many commodities became available just not that long ago, and Korean advertisers were in marketing wars with each other cars, appliances, all those things were heavily advertised. Also, in early 80s, Chon do came to power and his reforms changed institutional structures of South Korean advertising drastically. That extensive system of advertising censorship was set up around the time. Also, there were changes in how terrestrial broadcast advertising was sold. There was an organization introduced which was selling advertising for all terrestrial channels and they had no opportunity to sell the advertising independently. So with Chon Do reforms, one interesting thing that happened that many broadcasting channels were merged and made into public channels. However, those public channels continued to receive advertising. So there was this tension between public channels, which are supposed to be serving the general public, and those channels relying, at least for some degree of their income, on advertising. So that provoked all kind of debates and discussions and seminars where how can we reconcile public television and commercial advertising. And some solutions that came out of those discussions were quite interesting. So there were proposals to have commercial advertising, which doesn't look like commercial advertising, but resembles public service messages. So those commercials were supposed to have some kind of edifying message, 
to benefit the public and display the logo of the advertiser in the end. So there were like all those ideas in the air and while that particular idea did not get realized, it certainly did influence the corporate advertising in Korea, which began to develop in that decade as well. And some Korean advertisers would go in that direction, trying to make commercials, which kind of mimicked public service announcements. Could you provide us with an example of a campaign that would be emblematic of this type of advertising you just talked about? Sure. This is actually a campaign from 1984, which has received so much praise that it's kind of unbelievable. So the campaign is called Lunchbox, Toysirak in Korean, and it is for one of Korean big groups, Sanyong Corporation, and the ad is very simple. It's actually print advertising, and it shows a picture of two lunchboxes. And on the side, there is a story narrated in the first person of someone thinking about his childhood when many children were living in poor conditions and not always had enough money to bring lunch to school. In those days, the teacher would bring two lunch boxes and he will eat one himself and one distribute to his hungry students. And one day, so that's the story of the advertisement, the teacher gave both boxes to the students saying that he was not feeling unwell and didn't want to eat it himself. So that ad appeared on Teacher's Day and it was printed in newspapers and it provoked so much praise. So it was compared to poetry, it was voted I think the advertising in which the hundred years of Korean advertising culminated. And up till now, it is regularly brought up as an example of emblematic Korean advertising, which captures those Korean feelings, Korean aesthetics, the best ideas of Korean advertising. And what's remarkable about that ad, we learn absolutely nothing about the advertiser. And that's one of the things that is praised for. The title of your dissertation contains an interesting way of describing advertisement, the flower of capitalism. Where does this phrase come from and what does it refer to? So flower of capitalism is a very banal, cliché description of advertising in Korea. So whenever advertising is mentioned, very often the author would mention advertising, the flower of capitalism, and go on with his or her story, whether it is critical or appreciative of advertising. So basically, advertising flower of capitalism is such a common expression that most Korean speakers don't even register it as a peculiar thing to say about advertising. So for me, I noticed that first when I was presented with a book, Advertising in Korea, an English language book written by Korean professor, advertising historian Shin and Sop. And it is a pretty serious book which narrates history of Korean advertising. And to my surprise, it was decorated with tiny, cutesy little flowers, like Mugunghwa, Korean national flowers. And I was a little bit surprised to find them on the cover. So I asked Professor Shin, like, is it there to signal Koreanness? And he said, yes, but it's also because advertising is flower of capitalism. I was like, okay. And from that moment, I started paying attention to that metaphor and collecting instances where it came up. And it did come up quite often. Perhaps the most entertaining examples were once I attended um, conference for one of academic associations related to advertising and they had their conference brochure decorated with flowers because advertising is flower of capitalism. Is Korean advertisement then unique and separated from other advertisements in the world? Well, there are differences and there are similarities, so I wouldn't go quite as far as to say that it is completely unique and unlike anything else in the world. There are certain things which are similar in advertising in different countries in general. So advertising is there to sell goods and you have lots of advertising in Korea, which is, you know, the standard advertising, like you have a commodity, someone says that it is wonderful and you should buy it and that's it. So there's lots of advertising like that in Korea. What is unusual in Korea is that 
the advertising that is appreciated, that advertising that is praised, it's advertising like that lunchbox campaign which I described. So it would be advertising which kind of forgets that it is advertising. It's advertising that tells sentimental stories, that talks about values, that inspires people and delivers those warm feelings. And whether commodities are mentioned or not, it's not that important. So it is those campaigns which often win consumer popularity prizes. It is those campaigns which often appear in advertising textbooks as, as examples of what advertising should be like. It is such campaigns which advertising practitioners bring up as the kind of advertising they would like to make, why they chose those jobs. As you put it in your dissertation, the marketing aspect and the commercial interest of advertisers are often subordinate to, and I quote, humanist values and democratic ideals, as well as the presentation of ideal visions of the national community in Korean advertisement. That sounds counterintuitive and too good to be true. I'm glad it sounds counterintuitive. One of my ambitions was this project, definitely for the dissertation, but more for the book, into which is being transformed right now, was precisely to make advertising something very familiar, very mundane, sounds strange. I wanted to people to wonder, like, okay, we are used to advertising in everyday life, but in fact, it could be something else, and maybe we shouldn't be used to what we have and consider what else advertising could do in the world. So in Korea, there are certain ideas that advertising is a medium with public obligations. And what I mean by that is that sure, people know that advertising is paid for by advertisers who make it to sell their commodities, to promote their interests, and all that is understood. However, there is also an idea that advertising uses public spaces. Advertising uses airwaves, advertising uses space in the newspapers, it circulates in the public sphere, and as such, it should do so responsibly. So it is that idea that because it's a public medium, it actually should be conscious of that. It means that there are certain things that advertising ideally should accommodate. So as far as advertising content goes, those would be humanist ideals, sentimental stories to tell, so things which deliver pleasure to viewers, listeners who want to be inspired by such stories. This is not to say that all advertising is like that. There is plenty of very banal, trivial advertising in Korea. But as I said before, there is popular appreciation for advertising that goes for that message, which is loaded with what is perceived as good values, that tries to make people better, that tries to improve society, that tries to comment on social values. As for advertising as a medium for democracy, that's kind of a complicated story. Basically, it starts in 1974, 1975. As you might know, there was a moment in Korean history known as Donga White Pages incident, and that's happening during Park chun hees military dictatorship. There were tension between Park government and journalists. So Park was trying to control mass media and prevent critical reporting, whereas journalists who considered themselves conscious of society, at least some of them were trying to protest, they were signing petitions and trying to cover some critical information. And at that time, journalists of newspaper called Donga Ilbo signed such a declaration opposing media censorship. And in response to that declaration, Park's government put pressure on the newspaper's advertisers to withdraw their ads from the newspaper. So the idea was to starve newspaper of its advertising income so that the newspaper fires its critical journalists or deal with them in some way. So that was happening around Christmas time, which is in Korea also high advertising season. So the disappearance of advertising in Dong Ilbo was quite noticeable. 
And at first the newspaper was kind of trying to cover it up, but a few days, basically they lost most of their advertising. So they came out with what became known as white pages, Pekchi in Korean. And that's how the name of the incident happened to be Dongai, Ibo white pages. So after that, many in Korea noticed the situation and people started sending encouragement advertisements to the newspaper hoping to support it. So suddenly newspaper had hundreds of new advertisers who were regular people who would post notices of encouragement often anonymously, basically saying that they support democracy, they support freedom of press, they support critical journalists, things like that. So within that situation, advertising suddenly became a medium for promoting democracy. So first it was a medium for press and critical newspaper because withdrawing advertising was a way to silence the criticisms, but then regular citizens took over and claimed advertising as a very unexpected medium to voice criticisms and to support the newspaper. So at that moment, I think advertising was kind of reconsidered, reconfigured as a medium for promoting democracy. And that particular story, Dong Albo White Pages incident, it is often told as a chapter in Korean pro-democracy struggles, though it's told usually in relation with a newspaper itself. But in my research, I emphasize that advertising was in fact very central to that. So those ideas of advertising as a medium whose responsibility is to support media, to support critical media, they kind of never disappeared and they keep surfacing again and again. And it's one of the things I wrote about in the dissertation I'm writing about in my book is some advertisers boycotts in 2008 and 2009 which were informed precisely by that logic. Could you maybe tell us that story very quickly as well? Sure, well that's another story which is kind of hard to make into a quick story because it's kind of complex and quite counterintuitive to outside observers. So in the summer 2008 in Seoul there were huge demonstrations against signing free trade agreement with the United States because it would allow beef imports to Korea and many in Korea believed that it was contaminated with mad cow disease. So many concerned people hit the streets and were protesting the government which seemed to be pretty sad on this deal. So in this situation South Korean conservative media were very critical of the protesters and they were suggesting that perhaps they are motivated by North Korea or they are misled and basically discounting those protests as illegitimate, as not truly protest against the government. And in that situation, that kind of reporting provoked a particular internet group at the time to start a movement to counter those depictions of protests, to counter the newspapers which were telling those stories. And it started as an online forum and participants of that forum were talking about how to put pressure on the newspapers. And eventually they came up with the idea of boycotting advertisers of the newspapers. So the original idea was to put pressure on advertisers so they withdraw advertising from newspapers so that newspapers hear the voice of consumers and change their reporting. And that year, members of that group began calling the advertisers, they left messages, they think threatened some advertising managers in those advertisers to basically convince them to withdraw the advertising from the conservative media. In 2008, that was one campaign and they kind of repeated similar boycotts next year, except at that year it was ruled illegal to call advertisers. So they just announced boycotts on their website and were trying to put consumer pressure on advertisers to convince them to withdraw their advertising from conservative newspapers, which this organization was trying to oppose this way. The very logic of them that 
the members of organization which was doing the boycotts, they were arguing that as consumers of media, as consumers of commodities, they have the right to decide how companies should spend their advertising budgets. So during their press conferences, they would be very specific saying, as consumers of these companies, we demand that they spend their advertising on media, which we think is good for Korea, which we think is supporting ideals that we can subscribe to. So in their mind, the fact that advertising was a business expense of advertisers was not that significant. What was significant was that advertising was a public media. It had this capability to support particular media outlets and as consumers of commodities, as consumers of products of those companies, those activists were demanding that their voice is heard how those companies spend their advertising money. So that kind of logic of democratizing advertising, I think it's hard to imagine in many other places. And whenever I tell this story to North American audiences, people often get confused and they kind of assume that those activists are just raving lunatics who don't know that advertising is a private business expense and you know, ultimately it's up to advertiser. And what I find fascinating is the story is they do know that, except they think that what is more important that advertising circulates publicly, advertising has public obligations, and democracy should trump private interests of advertisers. As you wrote, Korean advertisement involves ideal visions of the national community. What kind of visions do you see in Korean ads? I don't mean that about all advertising in Korea. It is about specific subgenre of advertising, which I called humanist advertising. And well, it's actually not my term. I heard it described like that by one advertising practitioner who was talking about advertising he wants to make, but that kind of advertising is also known as sentimental advertising, emotional advertising, commercial public service advertising, and even kind advertising, like Chakan Kwango in Korean. So in those ads, very often the story evolves some kind of ideal harmonious society where everyone is getting along and it would be a very sentimental story perhaps of everyday life of regular people and there might be some problems there but they all all solved by people helping each other being kind to each other having good values so it's kind of this ideal of harmonious community getting along and what is peculiar that it is advertising telling the stories and maybe I'll say why it is peculiar, because normally advertising does tell moving stories, but the point of the story is that if you buy the right commodity, you could be part of that community or something. In Korea, commodities sometimes figure in those stories, but very often they do not. So it would be just like 15 seconds of some kind of glimpse of harmonious humanist utopia where everyone is helping each other, caring for each other, having intense feelings, and that's a commercial. Do you see advertising, therefore, as a mirror of the society's ideals? Or might things actually work the other way around? And does the marketing industry manipulate what society sees as an ideal for its own future? It's kind of two questions there. So first of all, advertising is a mirror of society. In some ways, it does reflect what is going on. However, it's not a mirror in a sense that it provides a truthful depiction of what's actually out there in reality. Rather, advertising portrays an idealized version which could inspire people to maybe buy commodities or maybe adopt a different lifestyle. So in a sense, it's a mirror of the dreams of society rather of actual reality of what's going on. In that regard, I do very much like argument of communication scholar Michael Schutzen, who talks about advertising as capitalist realism, as official art of capitalist societies. So obviously his analogy is with socialist realism, and the argument he's making that both socialist realism and capitalist realism, they do not portray societies as they are, but rather beautified versions which 
justify those societies to people who live in them. So for advertising capitalist realism, it does reflect ideals of good life people have, and those ideals are very much linked up to the conditions of living in capitalist societies, what is possible, what is desirable, and how is one to go about pursuing those desires. And the second question was about marketing. I think marketing industry would like very much to manipulate what happens in society, but I don't think they could do that. And there are many reasons for that. First of all, marketing as a science, it's not that evolved as many people would imagine. So if marketers decide to do something, they might succeed, they might fail. And generally human behavior is complex and it's hard to basically manipulate people into certain behaviors. And evidence to that would be a number of advertising campaigns, number of marketing campaigns which fail every year. And that happens in Korea, it happens in North America. So not all marketing is successful and even desires to convince people to adopt certain buying habits or certain social values, they might work, they might not work. And another reason for that is very practical. The conditions of working in advertising industry, at least in Korea, are very hectic. So people work against tight deadlines and you'd think that the main motivation for someone working on an advertising campaign is to sell a commodity. And it might be true, but very often it's people trying to impress their colleagues, impress their bosses, not simply have enough, enough time to come up with something they would actually like. So it's lots of little contingencies which go into production of each advertising campaign. So in a sense, there is no room to have like this perfect strategy which could affect this change in society, even if that was possible to achieve. Are those humanist advertisements done mostly by Chebol, who are big conglomerates and don't need a specific product pushed, but rather an improvement in their image? Yes, that's a very good question. Indeed, such advertising in some ways is kind of a luxury and small companies don't go for that because it is expensive to produce, they are nervous of the effects and it would be mostly Chebol who do such campaigns. How does Korean humanist advertisement differ from other social awareness campaigns in different countries? For example, United Color for Benetton's, the Italian fashion label, uh, ran numerous campaigns in the past that were supposed to create awareness for racial discrimination, environmental issues, as well as HIV AIDS. There are similarities in a sense that sometimes those campaigns are taking up social issues and confronting them. What is different about humanist advertising, sometimes it is kind of a sentimental message conveyed to effect of moving sentimental feelings. So that kind of social message which is perceived by people who appreciate humanist advertising is specifically in that sentimentality which is experienced by people who view it. So it is not activist stance in a sense, this is a problem in our society, let's fix it. Rather, it is more like trying to get people to think about kindness, humanity, things like that. So it's not targeting specific things, it's just kind of overall outlook that such ads are promoting. Where do you see the origins of these humanist values and democratic ideals, to use your wording once again? Why do we see this in Korea, but not elsewhere? Is this something purely Korean? Again, I wouldn't insist that this is a unique thing to Korea. For example, after I presented my research, some people forwarded to me advertising campaigns from Taiwan, which would fit the definition of Korean humanist advertising. So. Perhaps there are other places where you could find similar things. As for the reasons why in Korea such advertising is so popular, why in Korea people appreciate it so much, there are multiple reasons, some of them cultural, some of them historical. So basically, in my work, I track it to history of capitalism in Korea and how there was certain ambivalence about capitalist 
motives per se and very often for many people capitalism was a part of a nationalist project where the goal is not private enrichment but rather defending Korea's independence creating national wealth so there was like certain tension between private profit seeking and capitalism as a means for national advancement so that kind of plays out in advertising where there is certain unease when advertising is just a medium to advance interests of particular advertiser on the other hand there is like a great appreciation when a company like samsung decides okay well we could advertise our laptops but instead we'll produce this campaign which will move people and that kind of is perceived that corporations care, that they want to participate in that broader nationalist project. So there is those ideas among advertising observers, and that's one of the reasons why such advertising is, is appreciated even now. From the perspective of consumers, do Koreans approach advertisement in a different fashion from consumers elsewhere? Most of the time, I don't think there are significant differences and, you know, Korean consumers are quite capable of making fun of advertising, of playing with advertising, of ignoring advertising. There is some difference which I found in the course of my field work and which was kind of one of my ethnographic discoveries, I think. So with those sentimental humanist campaigns, when I describe them sentimental, I mean extremely sentimental and we'll be talking about like a slideshow of black and white photographs of breastfeeding mothers, small children to a soundtrack of Let It Be sung by children. So it's kind of sappy, melodramatic, at least to my taste. So when I was watching those commercials myself, I kind of was feeling somewhat cynical about the corporations attempting to manipulate my feelings. So in my interviews, I was bringing up those campaigns, hoping to solicit some kind of criticisms of corporations, again, trying to exploit feelings. And to my surprise, I never got such a response. So for Korean people I talked to, those campaigns were to be enjoyed for that sentimentality. And the fact that it was advertising did not matter at all. So it's like a melodrama could be enjoyed for its sentimental melodramatic message for its improbable story, even though everyone knows it's improbable. So it's advertising, it's okay to enjoy it for that intense sentimentality that it traffics in. So that I think is pretty different because at least among my friends' acquaintances in North America, to confess that you were moved to tears to advertising is kind of rare. Whereas in Korea, it's a sign that you are a sensitive human being and there is no discrimination against advertising. It's a commercial medium. Therefore, it's suspect and emotions which it inspires are somehow less real and less valuable. Last year, you published an article in which you discuss an advertisement campaign for a brand of Korean soju from 2009. Could you briefly describe the campaign and what made it such a controversial campaign? The campaign is for Cool Soju. Cool is a brand name which appears in Korean there. And the controversial part of the campaign was that it showed one of young Korean celebrities named Yui in different situations designed to convey the coolness of the drink and of people who consume it. And one of the situations was her, Yui, having a date with a guy and asking him playfully, am I really your first? And that's kind of a loaded question in general and certainly in Korea. So the commercial takes a comic stance on that and shows a bunch of guys getting very uncomfortable with this question. So someone hides under a lamp, another one chews on a napkin. So very awkward reactions and cool Yui laughs at that and tells uh, those guys to think cool and that's a commercial. So when it was shown in Korea many people were scandalized by well, the whole situation and also by the fact that Yui was very young and many considered it inappropriate 
for her to appear in such a provocatively sexual campaign. So there were discussions online, like what's going on, and some of it was about societal morals, some of those critiques were specifically about UE being an appropriate model for that campaign. Surprisingly, in your article, you described this ad as a, and I quote, grassroots feminist intervention that celebrated women's sexuality serving women. Could you briefly provide us with the social context of this statement? Well, so when I saw that campaign first, I think it was on a subway platform, like on one of the TV screens I heard. So I assume that's another soju campaign, which in Korea tend to be kind of sexist and racy, usually kind of showing young women with minimal clothing, with very phallic bottle and kind of doing some kind of dance. So I assumed it's like another one of those, so I didn't give it much attention. Except a couple months later, by incident, I ended up meeting people who actually created that campaign. And to my great surprise, those people were women, young women in their 30s, junior mid-career advertising professionals. And they saw this campaign as a challenge to Korean patriarchy. So when I talked about them, about this campaign with them, they presented it as trying to challenge obsolete norms in Korea. And by doing it through advertising, they were hoping to reach young people like themselves, so younger generations, and hoping to change their mind about female sexuality. And that was that. So it is in that sense I was writing about it that way. That's how women who created this campaign saw it. They saw it as a challenge to patriarchal norms in Korea. To paraphrase, the creative minds behind the ad attempted to emancipate women from patriarchal norms through sex appeal, or as some would say, via their objectification. Isn't that a bit contradictory? Yes, as a researcher, I found this a very difficult situation to navigate. On the one hand, like as I said, when I saw that campaign, it did some basically, as you put it, objectifying women for purposes of advertising to sell commodities. And that was nothing particularly impressive there. Yet when I talked to women behind this campaign, for them, it was a part of their I'm hesitant to say feminist politics because it's clearly not feminist, but their politics to promote gender equality in Korea, to win some kind of recognition for women's sexuality. So I think if we think of it specifically for Korea, it's kind of possible to be more sympathetic to that position. And I guess part of my dilemma as a researcher was I did become friends with those women. So I kind of don't want to be too critical of them because, you know, they are my friends. At the same time, it is very controversial thing to do to try to challenge sexist norms with sexist advertising. So with that article, I tried to navigate that tension by saying that yes generally that kind of advertising it is objectifying women and it is portraying them as sexual objects at the same time it is women doing that in their minds it is actually a step forward to claim that women could have a sexual life and they could you know assert their sexuality to men and if men are uncomfortable with that we'll laugh at that so in that sense specifically for that moment in Korea, it was kind of provocative intervention. So I would like to give credit to this woman for trying to do that, though I definitely will not equate it to feminist politics. And how did the public react to the ad? There were quite a few critical reactions. And basically the reactions were to loose sexuality that people presume this ad was promoting and also the fact that Yui was so young and her image was kind of innocent girl that also was perceived as shocking in Korea. And I mean, it's happening in 2010. I don't even know if such a campaign would be provocative in Korea now, but back then it definitely caused some ripples and there were people blogging about it, people criticizing Yui for appearing in this ad. 
Was the message of the creators understood? It's hard to say. That's a really good question. I think probably not. It might have resonated with young people, but those voices were not that visible, at least in the blogosphere where those ads were discussed. So I think it was not quite as influential as they hoped to be. So it certainly was a provocative advertising campaign and it did spark interest and in cool soju, which for a while enjoyed popularity among consumers, but like whether it provoked a change in values, I somehow doubt that. Well, interestingly enough, together with um, commercials, the advertising company created a website which was dedicated to cool ways of handling dating situations. And the idea was to kind of make it a social media thing where people go there, young people go there, and they ask questions about how to handle situations which could occur in dating life and how to handle it coolly. To relate this back to what we spoke about before, is it fair to say that advertisement is a venue where social norms are being negotiated? Absolutely. For advertising to be noticed, it has to be saying something new and hence the temptation for advertising to challenge what's going on, to challenge existing social norms to basically incite interest. At the same time, if they push too fast, there are criticisms, there are different interventions which push back on those norms. So it's always some kind of negotiation between how far advertising can push and how much advertising public are willing to take. Probably around the world, advertisement is seen as a necessary evil. And as a result, many try to evade it. For example, via ad blockers or by skipping ads whenever possible. If Korean advertisement tries to align itself with the public interest, do Koreans see advertisement as less of an evil than people do elsewhere? When I started this research, I certainly was with a camp that saw advertising as pretty problematic part of contemporary social life. And one of my original interests in advertising censorship was a question, what is an ethical advertising? Like advertising is trying to influence behavior to convince people to do things. Like in what sense can we talk about advertising ethics? So in a way, studying Korean advertising was kind of a learning experience for me because as I mentioned before, I did realize that some people in Korea actually enjoy advertising. So they do want to see those short stories which tell about humanist values they do appreciate creativity that goes into that so in my interviews i was actually surprised that quite a few people said that i actually would stay for the commercial break because i enjoy advertising to conclude with a very subjective question in your opinion is korean advertisement ultimately better in some way maybe in terms of its effect on society than advertisement in other countries? I don't know about better. I would make a case that it is more interesting. And what I mean by that, that there are certain things which are expected of advertising in Korea, which are unthinkable in other places. And by that, I mean that relation between advertising and democracy, adver- relation between advertising and promoting values which have nothing to do with consumerism. So those values, those ideals, in some sense, they are at odds with the purposes of advertising, with immediate purposes of advertising as a medium that sells commodities. So because of this tension, there are always some kind of contradictions, controversies with South Korean advertising. There are many debates, there are opinions, and that I think what makes it interesting. So it's not kind of banal, necessary evil in people's life, which is avoided, but something that gets public attention, something that gets debated, something that gets to the forefront. Professor Federenko, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about my research. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, 
subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.